Hello, hello, everybody. It's 3.56 a.m. Central Time on the 25th of April, 2023. Hope you're doing well. Tuesday morning here in the United States. And while I temporarily have an internet connection, I figure it's a good idea to record an update in light of all the big seismic activity taking place. Let me go ahead and turn on a display capture so you can see what I see ever so slightly better. And of course, if you're not aware, let me just bring you up to speed. Several 7.0 earthquakes have struck, at least three, two yesterday and one today. Two north of New Zealand in the Kermadec Islands, fulfilling our forecast for the Kermadec's five to six days late. And then a new 7.3 struck today on the plate boundary over to the west in Indonesia. USGS has it anywhere between 6.8 and 7.3. Or, I'm sorry, Geonet has it at 6.8. USGS has it at 7.1. I have all of them showing right now. We could probably go over and turn off Geonet just because, it again, they report international earthquakes and they tend to report them even lower than the USGS. So we'll just get them out of there. Multiple sevens have struck, and forgive me if my voice sounds a little hoarse. This is tis the season to be a sneezing for me, spring and fall. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the USGS plate boundary map, and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here, the Indo-Australian plate, big-time movement going on from Indonesia back down to the Kermadec Islands. So two areas moving all the way across this area, right in the middle of this area. A big, deep seven struck, well, over seven days ago, right in here. And it was a topic of discussion in my videos just a few days back, four to five days ago. We talked about the big, deep seven that happened down below the north side of the Indo-Australian plate. So a big, deep seven now followed by two shallower sets of larger earthquakes on either side of it spread out somewhat equidistantly to the east at the Kermadex and to the west at Indonesia. So, for the Kermadex, north of New Zealand, this fulfills the forecast six days late, five to six days late. We issued a warning for the Kermadec Islands to be on watch for 7.0 level activity, and that was in the last forecast. So now here we are. New 7.1 is struck there. There was a tsunami warning issued, but then they canceled it within 30 minutes of issuing the warning. The tsunami warning over here was also issued, but I don't think any waves were recorded. We'll find out tomorrow. It's a big amount of activity spreading out in both directions from the 7 that struck down below, which was down below the Indo-Australian plate. Now, that's not all that struck. So we saw a significant increase go out on both sides. And when I say both sides, I say both sides of the deep earthquake that you can't even see on the screen here right now. Up to the north, multiple fives have struck in a stepping stone path going up to Japan. So recapping big earthquake activity on both sides of the deep earthquake. A spread of fives now going up to Japan instead of fours. We go across Asia where there's no activity would report out of Myanmar, or out of India, or out of Nepal, or out of China. And I saw some videos that appeared that were basically showing multiple tornadoes formed across Myanmar in the past few days. Very, very rare activity for tornado activity to take place there. Also, tornadoes taking out a good portion of several towns in Oman. And that's pretty significant as well. So the tornadoes, I'm not saying they're related to the earthquakes. I'm just saying in the areas where we don't have any earthquakes reported, get some, some, pretty, <laughs> some pretty weird weather, guys. Let me get a sip of my coffee while you think about that. Well... That's the last sip of coffee, so I'm kind of screwed. I guess I'm going to have to run out and get another drink. Dang, okay. So, let's go over to the west. Multiple mid-range fours. Striking over to the west, spread out across an area like a triangle. 
pointing over towards the Caspian Sea. In case you don't know, this is the Caspian Sea here. We're right on the border of Azerbaijan, going up into the edge of Ukraine. And this is not related to any military activity, I don't think. This is many kilometers down on the crust. These are all the same sized earthquakes going across the area, pointing like an arrow over to the west where our previous activity struck down by Malta and down in southwest Turkey. We can get those earthquakes out of there. They struck a day ago. And here's what's hit since, big earthquake-wise. Obviously pretty small. You see a significant amount of activity. These are all small earthquakes going up across central Italy. So I would look between Italy and Turkey for a new outbreak to take place in Greece, right on the edge of the plate boundary next to Crete. Going back over it again, three significant sized earthquakes, two areas, the two different sevens, or some people are just saying it's one, were reported down by New Zealand, and of course the one earthquake, the big one, over at Indonesia. Let's jump across, go over to Central and South America, same sized earthquakes, well, minus the sevens, same sized earthquakes spreading out across over into the Caribbean. Multiple mid-range fours and a 5.3. And that's pretty much like what's going on up towards Japan. Going up across Philippines, going up to Japan, 5.1, 5.3, mid-range fours. And going over to the east, 5.1 to 5.3, and mid-range fours. Down to the south, mid-range fours. You see them on the coast of Chile. And a 5.4 originally a 5.3 they actually upgraded this earthquake so it again is the same size it's within a hair of a point moving on this side down here to the south over here to the east and up to the west northwest and when i say down to the south down to the south of the south pacific and to the east of the east pacific and to the west northwest of the pacific going out into the adjacent plates so it looks like we're going to see a spread of sevens. I mean, it does, we're already seeing a spread of sevens. This is what we were looking for to happen. But it looks like it's going to be going all the way around the plate, which means Japan, Alaska, coast of Chile, and Central America should all be seeing some pretty significant activity as the activity spreads around the Pacific. Now, you can clearly see we're going down to this side of the Indo-Australian plate, and we're going to the north side of the Indo-Australian plate. It means China's going to light back up. We haven't seen any significant activity reported out of China in many, many weeks. Just some fours. That's way low. And now look at it. It's on its way. So, one more time. Plate boundary map coming out of Indo-Australian plate, going up into China, going up into Japan going over to the east, over to Central America, and all the way down south of the Nazca Plate into Antarctica and beyond down to the South Sandwich Islands, which is what I just showed you. These quakes, these quakes, and these quakes. It's a spread going in all directions, and fives right now, where there's not sevens, we're seeing a stepping stone path of fives. The stepping stone path of fives Looks like it's leading out to sevens in between where all the activity is spreading. So if you look at this big open area, for instance, I would warn North Japan up to Kamchatka. That's the Kuril Islands right there where the big arrow is. And that's most likely where the next seven is going to strike up on the north. As we go over to the east, I would get back over here to Chile going up towards Peru on the north side of Chile. So Chile at Peru and Japan once we get up to Alaska. First, we have to wait for Japan, but we can look between our current sets of earthquakes to determine the spot to watch on the magnitude. I'm going to wait for Japan to hit. But the spot, you see where the rings overlap? Central Aleutian Islands. So that's the spot to watch. Magnitude will be determined why, by what comes up to Japan versus what goes over into China. Where to watch in China? North side of Nepal, north side of Bangladesh, or just west, central, southwest China, right at the bend of the plate. 
where it's big and open, that there's no seismic activity, of any size at least, being reported. Okay, USA, I mean, hold on one second, I gotta get a drink. My voice is about to collapse here. Just hang tight one second. I'm just going to leave this in the recording. I am recording right now. So, we'll upload this to YouTube, but you guys get the live break. Maybe everybody can take a quick drink break. I'll be right back. Hang tight. Oh, dear God. Oh. <sighs> Hello. Okay. All right. I can talk again. Dude, I was sitting here parched. I thought I had coffee in my mug. And I didn't. All right. All right. Now, nice and smooth. Get back to that... The, the svelte overtones, all right? Okay, yeah. Bedtime stories with Dutch, right? Gonna put you to sleep. People were telling me I should I should do some kind of voiceovers or something. I got a, some kind of radio voice, they said. I said, dude, I'm gonna read Good Night Moon to everybody. Man, I'll make a fortune, and then I'll read romance novels. And Man, like Fifty Shades of Dutch, right? Imagine me reading that. Good Night Moon or Fifty Shades. Either way, somebody's gonna be listening to it at night. All right, okay. Got your attention? <laughs> Class, pay attention. I literally got out of here. I walked out of the room. Your teacher's like, I'll be right back. Class starts throwing paper airplanes, spitballs. Okay. All right, let's just start over. Okay. Multiple large earthquakes have struck in the West Pacific. Going out across over into Asia, we're going to look for China to move. We're going to look for Japan to move up on the north side, up at the Kuril Islands. We're going to look at China to move over on the plate boundary that way, over right at the bend of the plate boundary where the arrow is. Okay? For South America, we'll watch along the coast of Chile again, but this time right at the border of Bolivia, South Peru. Man, can you tell? Like, my voice got, I just got like, like the Tin Man got some oil or something. All right. <laughs> you like that analogy? Okay, I don't know where that came from. All right, let's go look at the United States. So, over the past day and a half, look at what happened. Wow. Everyone sending me messages. Dutch, where are you? The East Coast got hit. Right next to where you issued the warning, the second spot. And I'm like, look, I'm off most likely for a reason. We got our 4.5 out off the coast. I had issued the warning for Delaware and New Jersey. Second warning was issued up to the east by northeast at southeast Quebec, New York border with Vermont and New Hampshire. So first the earthquake struck off the east coast. Then the earthquake struck up to the north, and it's a swarm now. But let me open up something. Take a look at this. Well, I'll be. Oh, my goodness. Look at the earthquakes over the last seven days. Now, it might look like a mess of quakes. Let me turn off the numbers. Everybody can understand shape recognition. So we look at the earthquakes going down through Texas and then go back up the East Coast, it matches something. It matches the edge of the North American Craton. Now, this is a huge thing. There's a flow of earthquakes that's going down through Texas and then back up the East Coast, following that edge of the Craton, coming from the west, going to the east. But the plate is moving 
from the east to the west. GPS shows that at the surface. So what's going on? The earthquakes are going one way. The top of the plate is going the other. And the earthquakes, of course, are down in the plate. So I think it's more like, almost like a log rolling over in a, in a lake. Or more like your mobile phone vibrating across the surface of the countertop when it, you have it set to vibrate. So if you think about your mobile phone vibrating across the countertop, the vibration is actually going the opposite way. Then the, the phone is moving. The phone is moving across the desk to the left while the vibration is going actually to the right, and it's moving the phone to the left. Same principle applies to a snail moving on the ground. Same principle. Okay, so the earthquakes are doing almost the same thing. They're going under the plate or through the underside of the plate, and the plate at the surface is going to the east to the west while the earthquakes are going west to the east, and they're flowing across the edge of the craton. So I want you to remember that craton diagram. Got to remember that. That's the way the earthquakes are going. And so that's why I issued the warning up to the east northeast and southeast Quebec, right on the edge of the craton, in between the two previous sets of earthquakes, and the magnitude is, well, now it's 3.6. Started at 3.9. So let's just call it a 3.6 in swarm, or if you add it all together, I'd just say equals about a 4. So a 4 struck up on the northeast edge of the craton. Again, if you take it all and add together. Otherwise, it's a 3.6 to 3.9 in swarm of small earthquakes. Now, if you look across the rest of the craton, we go down to Texas, we go over to Oklahoma. In Texas and Oklahoma, this little triangle of quakes, well, not little, there's so many there, every single one of them is directly next to a drill point. And we could pick a spot. We could pick any one of the clusters of quakes, click on it, and you will see. I'll just pick the biggest of the bunch, the 3.2. This is at Mentone, Texas, or Mentone. Mentone. Ah, uh, there's always a way to say it that I can't pronounce. Let's just go and look it up and show you what's there. I don't have any of my place marks turned on, so we'll just see surface features. and should be pretty easy to identify what the cause of the quake is. It's going to be the drill points that are here. Look at all the different drill points for all the different oil and gas pumping operations. And we're not talking about small. Uh, these tanks will either, usually they'll actually hold chemicals. In many cases, they'll hold chemicals. And in some cases, they can hold oil or gas, of course. But um, chemicals can get put into the ground. They'll take these pools of water where it looks nice and clean. It's because it is. They'll collect rainwater in a lined pond, then they'll take it and put it into the ground. They'll mix it with toxic chemicals and then put it in the ground and to break apart the shale to release the oil and gas, and then it leaves the toxic chemicals in the ground as a way of disposing the toxic chemicals. So big industry will put those toxic chemicals up for sale on the market, so to speak, a way to dispose of it, and the oil companies will put it down to the wells, break apart the shale, leave the nasties in the ground. It's called wastewater disposal at the same time produces oil and gas out of old wells where they drilled previously. Now look next to it, and all of these are drill points. Every single little pad on the ground, every little white speck on the ground. Here's what a town looks like, just so you can see for a point of reference what a town looks like. And then around it are where the oil pumping operations just go into just absolute insane. I mean, there, it's just so many of them. I'm not against oil and gas at all, uh, but, you know, again, we're on the edge of the craton at when you get this many drill points going across an area where a seismic wave is flowing through the plate. And that's why it's a big deal to remember that craton diagram one more time because there's a wave that's going down across the edge of the craton, down through Texas and back up the East Coast. And if we drill along that edge, we have to be aware that that wave is going to be attracted to those drill points, just like as if you're bending a piece of cardboard with perforations in it. We perforate along the edge of the craton all the way from Wyoming down through Colorado, north and south, down through New Mexico and down through Texas to Oklahoma. And we get earthquakes that break out along that line and seek out those drill points as opposed to the natural features. Mother Nature used to flow through this edge of the craton. I mean, it still does. It just seeks out the drill points as a spot to release. Some people ask me, do I think that that release has a release effect? Like, does it expend some of the energy going across the plate? No. 
unfortunately. I mean, counterintuitively, it doesn't. You would think it might. Most people would think it does. I think it even does on the West Coast. But in the Midwest, it actually is aiding in the flow going across the plate, at least as far over to Oklahoma. Once it gets to Oklahoma, it runs into the New Madrid seismic zone, where there are no drill points on the New Madrid directly in South Missouri, where the single earthquake is. Instead, there's drill points on the north side, up in Illinois and Indiana, and there's drill points on the west side, right here in central Arkansas, right on the edge of the New Madrid. And there's drill points on the south side, down here at Alabama and Mississippi. So it's drilled on pretty much all sides, the New Madrid. And our earthquakes go over to the New Madrid, tend to go down and around the south side edge, following through those drill points, and then go up to the east coast, where there's previous drill points from a long time ago, where we could talk about New York and the oil production that used to take place up there in, what was it, like the 1800s, I think, is when it took place. Now let's go out on the west coast, because I want to show you something else. Take a look one more time at the earthquakes without the numbers. So you can just see the shape of the earthquakes in the last two days. This is two to three days worth of quakes. Here's the whole week. If you look at the whole week, first of all, the size of the rings indicate the size of the quakes. So here's our, for instance, here's our fours. So we have a four on the west coast and a four on the east coast. And there you go. Okay, so 4.5 on the west, or 4.5 on the east coast, 4.3 to 4.5 up on the west coast, up off the coast of B.C., Canada. Now, if we take it down to threes, you'll see the threes go right across the plate, and we get the same sized earthquakes of threes going from California all the way to the east coast on that Craton edge. Going down to twos and ones, it fulfills the edge of the Craton perfectly. Again, this is just two to three days worth of quakes here. Here's seven days, and here's two to three. So whether you look at seven days or two to three, it shows the illuminated I hate to use that word. People think I'm like trying to send a code or something. The the edge of the craton lit up with quakes. And they're the same size. So 3.6 on California, 3.6 in the East Coast. What does that mean? I mean, for an average person who doesn't really pay attention to earthquakes and doesn't really think about it, there's no loss of energy or hardly any. 3.6 on the west coast, 3.6 on the east coast, day apart, edge of the craton connected between quakes. So there's a spread of a wave that's going from the west coast to the east coast, and it's not losing any energy. It's actually bouncing back and forth. It's amazing. Uh, why am I so excited about that? It's a discovery I made. And there was a professor... I'm not going to name him because I don't want to embarrass him. The guy actually is probably a nice guy, somewhat. Anyway, this professor said that this couldn't happen, that it was impossible, and he was a geophysics medal winner. I mean, this guy ran the freaking agency over on the West Coast. And he said it couldn't happen because elasticity equations say that energy dissipates at a distance. And I don't disagree I don't agree with the guy on anything, so I can't bring myself to say the A word, which is agree. So I don't disagree with him, okay? I'm not saying that one earthquake causes the other. It, it does dissipate across a great distance. It turns out the few thousand miles of the United States isn't much of a distance for this very low frequency electrically induced wave that has peak points between, let's just say, California and Texas. So the way I want you to look at this, look at the threes and look out on California and look at the spacing going down the coast. It's the arrival of a somewhat equidistantly spaced wave. And it went into the plate and across the plate and it spread out. As it spread out, it went down to Texas and back up to the east coast. Now the size maintained itself all the way to the east side of the wave tank. Think of this like now a wave tank where we're putting energy into it the wave gets down to the one end, and hopefully it goes out and across, but usually gets reflected back into itself like a standing wave, hence the spacing. And it's going to be reflected back into itself 
So we now need to look between our current sets of earthquakes to find the next spot which should be struck. And the next spot that should be struck, thinking that this is reflecting back into itself at the breakpoint instead of going out to the letter X, the next spot to be struck should be between the New Madrid seismic zone and the northeast. So now we can zoom in and find our halfway points between our current sets of earthquakes to look for the next four to strike. And the next four should strike in Virginia at this point. So we can just get the warning out now to the people in Virginia on the edge of the Craton that a new four will be striking in the next several days. And that's because there's a wave going all the way across the plate from California all the way to the northeast. It's reflecting back into itself. And you're the halfway point. You're the point where the wave comes up next, the open spot where there aren't any earthquakes now, but you're sandwiched nice, neatly in the middle, in between the two previous sets of earthquakes. And I'd like to remind everybody, the last time that I warned, this was two weeks ago, or a week ago, I mean, we warned Delaware, New Jersey, we warned you for a 4.5. And then what hit was a 4.5, and it struck out here, which I'll get back on the screen right there. That hit just a few days ago. So I'm off by 150 miles outside of my 200-mile warned area. So I try to get it within 200 miles so I don't have to warn everybody. I'm 150 miles outside of that warned area. Okay, that's where the 4.5 hit that we were looking for. We're looking for extremely rare 4.5 to strike on the East Coast, Delaware to New Jersey. Then a 4.5 hit. Now we're going to watch over on land, this time Virginia, and this really goes into North Virginia. It's basically the same area that I warned before. So we're going to issue a second warning, this time on land. And, well, I mean, last time it was on land, too. So if I'm... It looks, I mean, we'll get another 4.5 out in the ocean. I probably should just issue the warning for that, right? But I base it on the current sets of earthquakes and the halfway points between them. If I'm 150 miles off, so be it. Mother Nature isn't working on my schedule. I'm trying to figure out what Mother Nature's is. And I think we've already kind of done that, at least to a point where other people can repeat the method. If you want to know how to forecast an earthquake, I'm explaining it as I go along. And if you want to know further, I've already put out a detailed video that's an hour long using current earthquakes at the time when I issued a warning for a 7.0 earthquake to strike on land in California. And two days later, the 7.0 earthquake hit on land in California. It was the biggest earthquake in 20 years for all of California. And that day I made the How to Forecast an Earthquake video, and it's titled that, How to Forecast an Earthquake by Dutch Sense. You're welcome to repeat the method. Now, before we go any further into the West Coast, I do just want to quickly say aloha to my viewers out in Hawaii and to also show you what hit. Look, there it is. So the new four came rolling in, and where did it strike? It struck east by southeast of Mauna Loa and south of Kilauea. Now, I do want to pull the coordinates and just go look it up because this is within the magnitude of what we were looking for. We were looking for this to go up, I, I think I said up to 4.9. Or did I say 4.5? Oh, man. Somebody in chat will remind me. It, it, it's a difference of 0 0.4. I just want to remember. I, I, I got a lot going on. Lost my internet like 20 times this week. Long story. Okay, there we are. There's Mauna Loa. Here is Kilauea. And we are to the east of Kilauea. Oh, they're right next to the houses. Here, I'm sure maybe even a few of my viewers might live or own something right in this. Uh, I have lots of people that watch in the area there. So I would recommend at this point, you should probably go check out the channels Doing Hawaii. Remember this, and go check them out. Seriously, I'll put links in the description down below when I upload this to YouTube. But go check out Doing Hawaii. Great, great, great guy. And also go check out Two Pineapples. Oh, they're great people. And Doing Hawaii and Two Pineapples have been covering live, diligently, the eruptions at Mauna Loa and Kilauea and anything else that has happened or will happen. I'm sure they will have that. And um, I've never talked to them personally, but I just have seen their coverage, and I just stand behind it. Uh, they do a good job on their live streams. They got it all live on their channel. You don't have to usually wait for a video. It's usually live on their channel 
where you can watch the volcanoes and that's what I would urge you to do at this point now that the new four struck right next to Kilauea I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some kind of new little bit of you know lava flow activity maybe kick up and show up on the camera it doesn't mean a new blast or anything it's just when you get seismic like this it's usually accompanied by some kind of activity at the volcano it's no brainer on that now let's look at the smaller earthquakes really quick and just see what's happening across the rest of the big island looks like the regular activity that we would expect after a flow comes in this is the previous flow this is the previous push guys it took all week for this to come in now look what's going on you got sevens popping off across the west pacific you got a stepping stone path of fives going up to japan and fours going across over into alaska we're swarming in alaska I haven't really even talked about it but we're swarming in alaska we got sevens in the west pacific and fives heading up that way hawaii is going to take the next step up hawaii is going to take a big step up over the next seven to ten days i'll just say that right now by may 3rd or 4th at the latest we should have seen some pretty significant activity in hawaii seismically speaking now, significant seismic in Hawaii usually means 5.0 plus activity. And if we're already at 4.1, I would put it at up to 5.5. And I'm basing this on something that doesn't exist yet, which is the activity that should go up to Japan and Kamchatka, which right now is sitting there high and dry. And I've got a warning I told you about at the start of this update which we're going to look here for a big release, a, a new 7, basically, or something similar. And when that happens, the flow goes up into Kamchatka. Let me show you on the USGS map. And this should hopefully, I think, make some sense. So I'm looking for Japan to go on the north side of Japan. We already went here at Indonesia. We already went here at New Zealand or Kermadex. And we're going to go up into Japan. There's a stepping stone path of 5s going all the way up right now. Make sure you can see all this. And it's going to go up to Kamchatka and then over into Alaska. The flow, the seismic wave. It's already spreading out. You can already see it with the sevens. But look at Kamchatka. I show this in almost all my updates when I mention Hawaii. It's like a big arrow made out of the undersea mounts itself that goes up and points into the edge of Kamchatka where the plate boundary is. Let's go to the USGS map. See it? See the plate boundary? Okay, now they don't have anything coming off there, do they? They have the Hawaiian Islands all the way down here, and we know the Hawaiian Island chain is well known. It's thousands of miles long and goes out all the way, I think, to Midway Island. But let's go look at Google Earth, and you can follow it this way. And then it makes a hard bend to the north, and there it is. So when we get a big push coming in from up here, the wave spreads across to Alaska, and like a fork in a river, some of it is diverted down and over into Hawaii. And Hawaii is like a dead end. Let me turn off all the quakes here. A dead end into this fracture zone that then goes due east and heads into Baja, which heads over to the east side of the Pacific. Now, none of this is on the USGS map. There's a big open area. They don't have the fracture zones. They don't have any of that stuff marked. But I'm here to tell you, when we see a big release in the West Pacific, a big push come up from down below, goes over to Europe, goes up to Japan, goes up to Kamchatka, and it goes down to Hawaii. And it follows that path. Okay? So I'd expect this to go up to about 5.5, a magnitude larger, a magnitude and a half larger, enough to cause pretty significant activity, uh, damage, actually, in Hawaii, just seismically speaking. Now, where to watch is, well, it's pretty simple. We watch in between our current sets of earthquakes, and this is like a big spiral or a big square of quakes there. I would look right in the middle. That's Kilauea. It's so basic, right? Like, it's like a giant target of quakes, and we would just look right in the middle of the whole thing. If this was a bunch of waves or ripples in a circular-shaped pool or a square-shaped pool, we would look in the middle for the most interference to happen. In that case, we would look in the middle right there, Okay. Now let's talk about the west coast of the United States. This ties in with Hawaii. So west coast of the United States is not affected by Hawaii. I'm just saying the same sized activity that's going to Hawaii should be coming over to the west coast of the United States again. 
And I say again, so this is going to be like what happened a few months back when those fives came rolling in in the northwest. So let's take a quick look and see what's going on. Small earthquake-wise, looking at, you know, twos, let's say. Up in the northwest, we only have a handful of twos. Taking it down to ones and zeros. Looks like we have a little swarm at Mount Rainier. So the volcano, Mount Rainier, on both sides of it. Going up to the top, down below the crater. Let's go pull the coordinates. 24 kilometers northeast of Ashford, Washington. Notice it says zero kilometer depth. Well, that's right at the surface. But it doesn't mean the volcano is going to erupt. It's just shallow earthquake activity up above something. Let me show you. So would you be shocked to find out that there's fracturing happening here? <laughs> We're literally on the side of the glaciers that come off the side of Mount Rainier. But we're down below them, of course. I mean, zero kilometers could go anywhere down from zero to 0 0.1, which would be several hundred feet deep. Like I said, does not mean it's going to erupt. So don't worry about that right now. We would see thousands and thousands of small earthquakes there. And harmonic tremors and bigger earthquake activity even. If it was going to erupt, I think. Knock on wood. Right? Like there'll be that time where it's just... All right, okay. Not now. Down to the south, we go to Mount St. Helens, and we just have two zeros. Look. Zero. We have a zero earthquake. Well, I don't know about that. That's probably a calculation thing. It's probably a microquake. It actually is probably registering above zero. If it's just a zero, the computer's re reporting in to tell us nothing's happening at Mount St. Helens. It's like, nothing's happening here. We're right down here inside of the crater. This is the dome at the center. In case you don't know about it, there's a rising dome at the center of Mount St. Helens. From the last eruption, the new dome is rising, and eventually it will either explode or it will get really big like the previous peak. That's where the zero and zero are. So we're Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens. This is a quarry blast, and this is a series of blasts or explosions reported north of the border up in Canada. I don't know about the 1.2 up here at Riverside, Washington. Don't know what's there. Have no clue. It's just a small earthquake out in the middle of nowhere. But when I see a small earthquake out in the middle of nowhere, I get curious and I want to go look it up. If I don't have to normally report on an area, I might find something there. This is a real-time lookup. This is how you do it. You pull the coordinates, put them in, go see if there's anything there. Pretty simple. And many times we find all kinds of interesting things at these earthquakes that are out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I wonder if I should turn on my borders and labels. That might help to identify the nearest areas, wouldn't it? Okay, well, it looks like we're at an area where there's not much there. <laughs> oh, wait, we have some interesting features here in the ground. Hold on. What do we have going on here? Yeah, looks, like a, looks like some kind of ladder. Some giant petroglyph, right? Better watch out. You start seeing right angles in the ground. Yeah, that's when you really know you got to look for stuff. I don't know. Uh, maybe there's something else here nearby that would justify the earthquake. We need to look at the area. Great. Oh. Well, look. From time to time, when you look up areas, you might find things. You may find things, you might not. And if I look in and I see, I don't know, I don't know. If I look in and see something like this, or if I look in and see something like this, I start to get a little suspicious if I see something like this inside of something like this. If I see this inside of this, I want to go look in the center and see what's there. Now at the center, it looks like some kind of plateau or something going on there, that some kind of farming going on. So that's not too suspicious. But if there was any kind of military nearby or any kind of other thing nearby that would justify that being there, that could explain that, I'd be interested to find out. 
So back to the earthquake epicenter. We have some cool formations here that are very, very interesting. They're giant fractures in the ground, fissures, if you will, that have formed a long time ago. I don't see anything else of any significance nearby other than the weird formation there in the rocks. And I mean the big triangular formations. Now you could talk about these all day long and the fracture zones that are in here. Oh, I'm sorry, the faults that are in here. Those themselves are worthy of mentioning. Okay. Enough time spent on that. See what happens when you look up a single earthquake. Let's recap. So we have two volcanoes that are barely moving. We have explosions north of the border. We have a lone earthquake out there at Triangleville. Over to the east, look at this. A swarm has broken out at Yellowstone and all around it. Going around and on the edge of the North American Craton. Craton, Craton, Craton. Guys, look at the edge of the Craton. This is my biggest discovery for the United States. This will be in the history books at some point. The flow of earthquakes going across the edge of the Craton. Look at the edge of the Craton going up into Montana in the northwest. See the big arrow? Now look at the earthquakes through Montana. And look at where the Craton edge goes. It goes down through Yellowstone directly. Now there's another supervolcano over on the purple side at California-Nevada's border where the purple part meets the California-Nevada border. There's a supervolcano there. So wait a second. There's a supervolcano at the California-Nevada border. That's Long Valley Caldera. And there's a supervolcano on the other side of the purple over at Yellowstone. So there's two supervolcanoes, and they're on either side of that purple part, the deformed edge of the Craton. And that's where the earthquakes are flowing out of. They're flowing out of the deformed edge. They're going up to the hard, stable edge. And then they're flowing down and around, down to Texas, which I already showed you and talked about. Now, coming from California, you're going to see a line of earthquakes that comes out of California and jumps across Nevada. You see our arrow. You see there's two sets of quakes in Utah. You see there's some earthquakes down in South Nevada. And then you see there's earthquakes in California. This is two days, and in three to four to seven, however many you want to put, it's going across that arrow over to Texas and around the edge of the Craton. So the flow of this wave that's going across, it's dropping off earthquakes along the way. And now that you know that, you can watch the wave yourself. My viewers did this over the past several days as my availability online was reduced. So now let's go over and look at California. Now that you understand there's a flow going out of California, what are we going to look for? I'm going to look for the same sized earthquake that we named out in Hawaii to come into Northern California up by Eureka. We have to go back to the USGS map now. Let me tell you why we're going to warn and where we're going to warn. First of all, energy going out to Japan, 5.3 already, stepping stone path heading up to Japan. I'm expecting a new large quake, North Japan, going into the Kuril Islands. Stepping stone path of fives, going up to Kamchatka, down to Hawaii. Stepping stone path of fives to head over into Alaska, but I haven't put the final magnitude on Alaska yet. We're waiting for Japan, remember? And we're going to expect those 5.5s to come around and go down into here, into the Juan de Fuca fracture zone. And I'd expect the flow, the wave, to strike out in the ocean, but we aren't getting many reports out in the ocean for one reason or another. But we should see it get reported on land or close to land when it comes arriving in here on the south side of the Juan de Fuca, right where it goes down into California on the San Andreas. The Juan de Fuca flows like a river out of the northwest, and down into the east-southeast, into the Craton. You will remember that Craton diagram, I promise. So now look at the earthquakes going down across California. This is a full six days, so it looks like a lot, well, because it is. But we'll just look at two, two days, and you should be able to see the flow goes in out of the Juan de Fuca, which I just showed you, where we're going to look for a new 5.5 to strike up here, where the Juan de Fuca comes in. And then the line of quakes going down the San Andreas. It goes all the way down to here. 
and then you see it's like a wall. It stops there and then picks back up like a line over on the east side. Same trajectory as what's going down along the coast on the San Andreas. So we get down the San Andreas, and we jump over and carry on down this way, down to the Garlock. That's exactly what's happening. We're looking at the exact same sized earthquakes all the way along the way. So the biggest of the bunch, a 3.2 out by San Luis Obispo, and a swarm of earthquakes at Parkfield. Well, why are we having a swarm of earthquakes at Parkfield? And why are we getting down to that point, just jumping off and not carrying on down the San Andreas all the way with a big line going all the way down? Well, there's drill points next to this. Right next to where these earthquakes are, if you literally go right over the foothill, and maybe one or two foothills at the most, you're at thousands of drill points right there. And I'll pull the coordinates and show you if you are a new viewer just east of Parkfield. This is where our oil and gas pumping operations go through the roof. Or, well, I should say go down through the basement. Just tens of thousands of them. Right up to the edge of the San Andreas, no less. So here is our earthquake swarm location at Parkfield. And here's the San Andreas in the topography itself. And like I said, tens of thousands of drill points. And they come right up to the foothills. And this is where they begin. All of this is drilled. And we get down here to this place called Missouri Triangle. And they've drilled this. Uh, here, let me turn on my place marks. This might help us. I've marked a lot of the oil wells just for easy identification so I don't have to zoom around and try and find them. Sometimes they can be rather obscure and hard to find. So we come down the San Andreas and we jump across the valley following the drill points in that trajectory. And there's more drill points down here. Right? You get the idea of how many there are. And there's a line that connects of drill points around and down and back up like a giant letter J. All of this is drilled. I do not exaggerate when I tell you this is all drilled. Right up to the San Andreas. So are you surprised to find that the seismic flow goes down and across this like a perforation? It goes from up here to down here. And then you get down here and you get a diagonal line of quakes going this way from the volcanoes at Volcano Peak. You see them all here, very impressive looking, and some that will erupt most likely in the future and uh, others that have erupted in the recent past, the past few thousand years, I think. Now let's go over and look at the quakes one more, or at the USGS plate boundary map one more time, and I'm going to turn on a feature. We're going to turn on the U.S. faults. Once you turn on the U.S. faults, this is going to make a lot of sense. The wave is coming down, gets to the drill points, gets derailed over to the east, diagonal line of quakes, then goes down to Ridgecrest and reaches the Garlock. Then it's reaching the Mojave Desert instead of L.A. The wave comes down, over, and across, and wants to make its way across the plate. Otherwise, it would stick to the San Andreas and go right down, and you'd get a lot of earthquake activity down here in North L.A., Instead, the flow goes down and over. That's exactly what's happened. Down in L.A. and down in Southern California, we'll get to Eastern California and Northern California in a moment, but down in L.A. itself, uh, Southern California, a noteworthy increase in the number of earthquakes. Now, the magnitude's not so much. They're zeros, ones, maybe a two mixed in there, not that much size-wise. You would just scoff at this. If you were looking at the size, some people wouldn't even pay attention to it. But when you start to see a bunch of vibratory activity, you wouldn't be shocked to hear that another larger earthquake would be accompanying all those smaller earthquakes. So I look for frequency, the number of earthquakes, frequency increase. So it's like the rolling of a snare drum, and then the bass drum kicks in. Right now, the snare drum is increasing. You can see it. It's going across the San Jacinto. It's focusing in down at the Salton Sea area, down at the ends a gap, and then back up into L.A. It's kind of backing up. The wave is backing up along the San Andreas. So this is a vibratory wave, a standing wave. It's going down through the following the faults. Let's go back to the faults on map, and I'll show you. Let's recap. 
line of earthquakes coming down the San Andreas, jumping across the drill points, going down to here to Ridgecrest. Comes down, goes into the Mojave. You start to get activity down here to the south. Instead of in L.A., bypassed across the Mojave and then focuses in on three distinct faults. San Andreas, San Jacinto, and Elsinore. And just like a wave coming across something, the first is to catch it is the San Andreas. And we start to see an activity increase along it right there, just north of Salton Sea. Then we spread out and go down and across and around it. And if there's enough of a push, it saturates all three sets of faults and all three start moving. Right now, it looks like two of them. It looks like mainly the, the San Jacinto with a nice spread going across the south part of the Elsinore, and then even further out where I don't even see one marked, which is a, a third line. Let's go take a look. What's out there? Nothing. They don't really have anything marked there, but it connects into the Pelican Hill Fault and the Newport Inglewood Rose Canyon Fault Zone down to the south out here. So there's really three lines of quakes this whole thing is saturated right now. The flow is coming down, going over, and coming down. So down, over, and down. Off the San Andreas, across the valley, down across the Mojave, down to Southern California. Only when a big wave is arriving. Otherwise, the wave is diverted mainly and goes over to the edge of the Craton. Now, speaking of going over to the edge of the Craton, let's zoom in and take a look at the earthquakes coming out of the northern part of California. Up here, one8 also a little swarm up at the border with Nevada. Whenever we see activity up in northwest Nevada and northeast California, right along the border there, I look for activity out in the ocean, over to the west, over here. And I already just told you, we're going to watch here for a new 5.5. Okay, now let's go see what's there. Lake City. Are we, are we in a lake? Is it water weight earthquakes? This can happen. Water weight earthquakes can happen. I'm not saying that's what's here, but we've seen that at Table Rock Lake in southern Missouri. A sudden influx of water and the caves and other things start to collapse and, or fill even, and it produces earthquake activity. Okay. Uh, wow. Oh, hey, look at this. Right next to Painted Point Butte and Black Hills Butte, Bittner Butte. Well, I do have to mention Bittner Butte. Whenever we see earthquake activity next to Bittner Butte, we tend to see earthquakes out in the Pacific, right off the coast, or right along the coast that are significant. This is an ancient volcano. Somehow this magma chamber, ancient, fractured, here shows a seismic activity. When the wave arrives, this thing starts to show seismic. The old lava flows alongside of it can still be seen. These are ancient. This is subsea volcano a long time ago when this was underwater. So we're right next to Bittner Butte. Also, Blowout Mountain is right next to it. If you don't know about it, Blowout Mountain is here. And the greater name of the whole area is called the Sheldon Antelope Pleistocene something or other volcanic field from the Ice Age. Okay, so wouldn't you say volcano? Let's go down to the southwest, down to Montgomery Creek, California. Pull the coordinates and go look it up. 15 kilometer depth. So we're going from volcano to volcano at this point. Uh, we uh, Up in the northwest, we're up at Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens. It doesn't mean that Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens are going to erupt. Just got to drive that point home. Same with Bittner Butte. Just because we're there doesn't mean it's going to erupt. It's a sign of the wave coming in. So where are we here? We're at Snow Mountain and Silver Lake. Also to the east, we have Bernie Mountain, but this one's just a few miles away. I look always within 40 miles of a significant volcano if we get seismic next to it. This is nine miles from the marked volcanoes from the Smithsonian. Silver Lake, you may remember my viewers a couple years ago. Seismic activity showed up next to this particular series of volcanoes. Then fires broke out just down to the south, down in California. Big fires, huge, like... 30, 40, 50,000 acre fires broke out after we saw activity up here next to Silver Lake and Latour Butte further to the north. Two volcanoes up there. I'm not saying that it's volcanic in nature, the fires. I'm just saying they, 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 we get the seismic activity showing up next to these volcanoes. Then we see fires break out. 
So down here in Northern California, just a little bit further to the south, you have Paradise, California. And those earthquakes broke out at Silver Lake and Latour Butte before that, which is why we were talking about that area. What's this? What the heck? Never had anything like that before in my life. Is that some kind of fishing thing? USGS fishing? <laughs> okay, all right. Somebody's fishing, right? Like, it just got caught. Let's go put the coordinates in. My connection goes down. I did. My connection goes down. I just got fished on the USGS site. Okay, uh, where are oh, we're at? Hydroelectric dam, are we? Looks like it. Hold on. Let's just make sure. No. Reservoir that's dried up that looks like a dam. It looks like it should have some water in there. That Lake Almanor without any water in it. Wow. When was this imagery taken? 2022. They said there was a drought. Well, not anymore, right? We're on the south side of the volcanic field that goes back up to Mount Lassen Volcanic Center, the stratovolcano, with its hundreds of volcanoes spread out across the whole area. Some of these are pretty impressive. Some are old. You can barely tell they're even a volcano. Swain Mountain, you can barely tell. Let's see if we have black cinder up in here. Does this one look like a volcano? Eh, not really. Oh, wait. I didn't zoom in on the right part. Yeah, it doesn't really look like a volcano to me. But then you get out near, and then right next to it, you've got a young version of it that's not been blasted away by time. And you've got a spatter cone. You've got a large sill and lava flow that goes out in two directions down to the lake down here and lake up here. Or basin on either side that became a lake. All right, so volcano, 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 volcano. I mean, come on, that's several. Is there another one down to the southeast? Let's go find out. Plumas Eureka Historical Site, California. Okay. I've never seen them list a historical site before as a triangulated coordinate. Oh, it's the previous fire location. That's where those fires broke out, guys. We're right next to Sugarloaf Butte and the Butte's Butte. Let's go look at those. Here are the Butte's Butte. Wait, is it just the Butte's? Looks like somebody was doing some kind of mining here a very, very, very long time ago. Look how old that is. Somebody was doing some mining there a very long time ago. The Butte's, again, to call these volcanoes, I would say it's not even doing it justice. They're not going to erupt again. They were volcanoes. The, the tuftage is on the side. It's a little hard to see. Old lava flows. But I would think this again formed back when this was underwater. And this was all underwater in case you don't know about the inland ocean. that The remnants of the inland ocean go to Salt Lake. But you can see all the old salt flats that go out over all the way to the California border. And this was all underwater at some point rose up and the water flowed out through the Grand Canyon. That's what made the Grand Canyon, not the Colorado River. Turns out they got that wrong. Yeah, it turns out they got a lot wrong, kids. Let's get a sip of this drink while you think about that. Over to the east we go. Mogul, Nevada. A negative earthquake. Nothing going on here. Energy is being sucked in in a giant vortex. A negative earthquake. It's a calculation thing to get a negative quake. It's just another microquake calculated whatever way. We're on the edge of Steamboat Springs, and I would think that these microquakes are related to the volcano that's here. And do you see all of the geothermal drill points? All the turbines that are there, I mean. And then the drill points spread out across the volcanic field of Steamboat Springs. So a swarm there. Are you shocked? I'm not shocked to see a swarm there, but when you see the spacing on the quakes going from volcano to volcano to volcano to volcano, and then you pick up here, let's zoom in on the line of quakes, it's kind of like it's dead ending there and spreading out across the drill points there. Then we spread down to the east-southeast, and what would you do if I told you that the rest of these locations 
from the east of the valley going across to the Nevada border. All three of these spots here at least are at volcanoes directly or volcanic features including in the East Valley. This is another big discovery that I made in California. A lot of California people need to pay attention to this right now including professionals. How about a bunch of fires breaking out in this spot? A bunch of earthquakes hitting in this spot and when I finally decided to look it up I found something volcanic in nature at the location that could possibly explain the fires and the earthquakes. Let me show you. This. This is a giant lacolith, a bulge created by magma far down below. This place is called Coarse Gold, California. Now next to it is another one, a smaller one. It goes up to Shaver Lake. Remember all the Shaver Lake fires? You can see the ripples of this lacolith covered in trees going up to the top that has a small depression. Well, not small, big. Big depression in the top, a basin in the top where it's filled with water. But this is rippled and this is a giant circular feature, if you want to call it that, that's bulging. And what creates this is bulging magma down below. It doesn't erupt. It just creates a pocket or a bubble. It's huge, though. This is massive. Now, earthquakes break around this thing. Fires break out around this thing and this one. And look what's on the other side of the mountain range. Directly on the other side. The super volcano. Long Valley Caldera. Long Valley Caldera, 1,000 cubic kilometers of melt or more. Measured down below it, classifying it as the super volcano. And on the other side is a matching in size lacolith. Supervolcano on one side, lacolith with fires and earthquakes all around it on the other, and a smaller one here. Now, I can show you an example of one of these over in Iran. Not just one of these. Dozens and dozens of these over on the plate boundary over in Iran to compare. So let me take you over to Iran and show you. Here we are in South Iran on the plate boundary, and I'm going to zoom in and find one. We could just pick any one of these. Again, they all show it. This one shows it pretty good. See this? Remember the shape that we just looked at in California? This goes back up to the top. This ruptured at some point in the past and flowed out. That's what created those ripple-like shapes. So this lacolith ruptured and created those ripples. Well, let's find one that hasn't ruptured or it looks like it's going to. Well, look at that. A giant circular feature, and it did rupture in the past. Obviously, you can see, especially on this side, showing the float out like nature of this. This is in Iran now. So these are all, and usually they collapse. Usually the magma retreats on the plate boundary at some point, and you get a collapse of it, and it leaves more like a crater like shape, or at least a depression if the lacolith deflates. Anyway, that's where the quakes are. Big discovery, right? Fires breaking out around this thing. Earthquakes breaking out around this thing. It's a giant bulging lacolith on the other side of the supervolcano. Worthy of study, I would say. Now, over to the east, take a look. Stack of earthquakes and stack of earthquakes. I just talked about it. The supervolcano that's right here, where I'm going to highlight all these. But what's over along the border? It's not a supervolcano along the border. So one stack is at the supervolcano, but we got to go look up and see what's at the other spot. Going over to California now. Good morning, everyone. It's 5 a.m. Central Time. This update's dragging on and on and on and on, but I'm in. I'm talkative. <laughs> Okay, is there anything here worth mentioning? Well, right next to it is Crater Mountain to the southwest. To the southeast, by just a few miles, we have the Yubihibi Craters. To the northeast, we have Clayton Valley Volcanic Center. <laughs> I'm going to measure to all of them. It looks like the closest is Clayton Valley. I always look within 40 miles. This might be more than 40 miles. Nevada is a big state, and this is pretty far. Eh, 27 miles. 
27 miles away. Okay, so Clayton Valley is close. Crater Mountain and the Big Pine Volcanic Field is also 30 miles away. Yubihibi is 37. We have multiple culprits around here that could be lending to this quake. I don't have any marked volcanoes directly at the spot. Here's Clayton Valley. Here's one of the cones of Clayton Valley. So you can see it's an ancient volcano, but still could show seismic activity as the wave is coming through the area and the wave seeks out the weak points in the plate. One lone quake over at Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Buttes. One lone quake over at Mono Lake Volcanic Field. This cluster up here south of Lake Tahoe going over to the east into Nevada. Let's go pull the coordinates. Go see what's there. Walker Lake. This is always fun when we get into the lake areas. Let's go see. And when I say fun, I don't mean entertaining fun. I mean science fun. Is there anything here nearby worth mentioning? What are all those? See all those? What's all that? What are those? What are those? Okay, take a look at it, guys. See those railroad tracks? They all go up to big bunkers. And the big bunkers are full of ammo and other kinds of military stuff. This huge army depot goes on and on and on and on and on for miles in all directions, and an earthquake right on the other side. Now, the earthquake on the other side, most people don't know about this, and I used to have the place marks for it. Maybe I can turn on the gallery. It might show. People have gone out here, and uh, geologists, and taken pictures, and that's the only way I know about this, of the lava flows that were out in here off the west side of Walker Lake. And, again, I would probably need to turn on photos, but I think Google Earth got rid of the photos in many cases. Maybe they didn't. Ah, huh. There you go. First one I clicked on. Wow. Cool. All right. Volcanic outcrop. So, one shot of it, just a whole bunch. There, it's just, that's just one of many. So volcanic outcrop, uh, old lava flows, unmarked volcano on the west side of Walker Lake up there in the mountains right there. And the earthquake's right next to it. That's where this one is. Now going over across the border over into California, is there anything different? Let's go turn on the borders and labels just to make sure we're centered around the border. Going over to Colville and Walker, Mount Patterson, I don't have anything marked over here at all. Highland Peak. Hold on. This is where the 6.0 earthquake struck. Two, maybe three years ago. Three years ago, a 6.0 earthquake struck right here at Mount Patterson. That's right. Belfort and Mount Patterson right here. I wouldn't call this an aftershock. You, you, three years later, you get an earthquake? I mean, come on. So something's going on here. I just wonder, uh, maybe we need to keep an eye on this spot here at the California-Nevada border, even though I wouldn't normally issue any kind of watch or warning, but it is where the 6.0 struck, and it's a pretty nice stack of earthquakes there. Normally, we're down here at the supervolcano only. This is the only one that stands out as odd. The rest are all at the volcanoes all the way down. That's not odd to me. It's not odd to see the earthquakes seeking out previous puncture points where Mother Nature is punched up through the plate. Just like humans drilling down into the plate, when Mother Nature punches up through the plate, it creates a weak point for this wave to go to. And now, everybody, let's recap. A diagonal line of earthquakes going from Northern California down the San Andreas, jumping across, making another diagonal line of earthquakes going northwest to southeast down here at Ridgecrest. Another diagonal line of earthquakes going northwest to southeast out of Northern California in a trajectory following all those volcanoes I just showed you right down to a cluster of quakes centered down in South Nevada. This is where we're going to wrap it up. Unless a big earthquake is hit during the time of this update. So we're dead ending down here and then we're going over on the edge of the Craton to the east over to Texas, which I showed you at the start of the U.S. update. But there's something here. There's something here in South Nevada. You want to see? There it is. See where it says Sugar Bar?
bunker. I'm going to turn on the Google Earth community, which will give us all the place marks for the information here. It says Doom Town, Operation Rise Line. This is where they built the town and blew it away and uh, the nuke tests. And these are all underground nuclear test sites. I end up showing the site a lot. They're not doing any nukes there now, as far as I know. This is strictly seismic release at an area where there are man-made faults created by all the blasting. So, for instance, the 160 kilotons uh, detonation here underground, September 21st, 1972. Just one of hundreds that go across the valley alone and spread out across this whole area. So this here nuke test site matches this here where all the small earthquakes are now hitting as the wave is passing through the area heading over to the east to our arrow in Utah. In Utah, Wasatch Fault going up across into Salt Lake City. We can just go ahead and tell the people in Utah up by Salt Lake City, you're likely going to be getting a new pretty rare mid-range to upper four by the end of the week around Salt Lake on the Wasatch Fault. Wasatch? It's the Wasatch Dutch. <laughs> okay. Okie dokie. Let's go on up and take a look. It's a little joke I got running with somebody I know that lives up here. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. You're going to love it. Okay. So what's here? Look at this. You see it says Space Shuttle External Engine Test Site. They're not doing the Space Shuttle there now. That's where they did it. Thiokol Corporation. The rockets. The deep bunkers again. And I'm not kidding on the deep bunkers. They're keeping... Well, and it's a rocket test site too, but they keep highly explosive materials. Or they got the rockets and all that. I'm not trying to give away their location or anything. But earthquake right next to it. Now down here, down by Magna... There are others. There's other deep drill points that we previously got hit at. But whenever I see earthquakes next to deep bunkers, and this is the second time I'm talking about it in this update, one over at a U.S. military base, the other up here at Thiokol, I just, I think they're branching out down below. Now, they might have to stop if the 5.0 range earthquake, 4.0, 5 to 4.9 strikes on the Wasatch this week. Down to the south, this cluster of Earth. Oh, by the way, we go from there down to the south, down to the south tip of Salt Lake. Let's show you there. Right down to here. And what's here? The other location for Thiokol with all their other bunkers. And mining facilities with covered mine conveyor belts, I think. I think that's what they are. Anyway, all right. You, you get the idea. I mean, come on, man. We're going from one to the other. We're, go we're literally going across from one set of bunkers down to the other set of bunkers down on the south side. The only thing missing now, let's go down in southwest Utah entirely. And I'm not trying to be a party pooper or anything like that. I'm not trying to get on anybody's nerves. Hey, look. Look at the name of the town we're going to. Minersville. Down at 8.9 kilometers deep. Well, I very seriously doubt we're in a mine that's miles and miles deep. It would be one of the deepest mines in the world. So let's go see what's here. 8 kilometers depth. Oh, well, the Minersville Geothermal Wells. And they're doing farming here, too. But they got geothermal wells across the Blue Knolls. Here, let me see if we can find one. Yeah, they got, they got all kinds of stuff going on here. I think that's for... Actually, they're using that for farming. Anyway, all right. So we're at the geothermal wells. We're at the basalt fissure and the unmarked volcano crater knoll. Why is that called unmarked? It's marked. Unmarked volcano crater knoll. Maybe they mean unmarked on some kind of map or something. Okay, all right. Well, you can see it. You can see the old sill. Is my height elevation feature turned on? Must be turned all the way down to minimize the hills. Or maybe that's the accurate hill. 
Anyway, we're in the middle of an ancient volcano, and that's where the earthquake is. Down to the south, swarm there. Now, it doesn't mean that volcano is going to erupt. That volcano is part of the greater thing that's going on here, which is the wave passing through the plate. That sums it all up. A bunch of earthquakes going down to Yellowstone. A bunch of earthquakes going from volcano to volcano to volcano down the eastern part of California, spreading over to a nuke test site and then over to more volcanoes over in Utah. We go over into New Mexico to go down into Colo- or down in Colorado. We go out of Colorado, down into New Mexico, and then over into Texas and Oklahoma. And then we get into our drill points. Once we get beyond there, we get up to the northeast, and that's just straight up the flow, the wave, reaching over to the edge of the Craton and striking on the east coast. Virginia's got to keep watch this week. From New Madrid to Virginia, or southern Illinois to Virginia. It's one state, Tennessee, in between the two. What an update this was, man. I've been sitting here for two and a half, three days in silence. People asking me if I'm bored. I'm like posting music via my phone. Okay, uh, what else happened? Is anything else struck since starting this update? Let's just go back and see. A new 5.3 struck in Ecuador, North Peru. Well, that fits with everything I told you at the start of this update. When did this hit? 535 UTC. Why did that not show up? Well, they've changed. Oh, they changed it. They changed it to 5.3. Now it's spot on at 5.3. Okay, I was like, where did that come from? Has anything else hit since starting this update? I don't see anything significant striking. So that's good news. All right. I would encourage you. Now is the time to have a good earthquake plan if you live in any of the areas that I talked about you can watch this flow go out across up and around you can follow the arrows that's what the arrows are on the map for but of course my stream has to be on for you to see that so you're kind of going to have to remember which way the arrows point it's like the weather so you can watch the seismic activity flow your way and just remember where the big earthquakes are now and then watch for the flow to spread out and drop off more large earthquake activity as it spreads out and away from where it came from. And where did it come from? It came from the deep earthquake down below, which you don't even see on the screen here. I'd have to turn on a different feed entirely. I have to turn on the USGS 30-day feed for us to see that. Let's do that. Let's turn on the USGS 30-day 5.5 plus feed, and we will see that big deep seven sandwiched right in the middle here, down below. And that's when I issued the warning. Talked about watching it in New Zealand. Talked about watching over at Indonesia. Both have now been struck by the expected earthquakes. And let's get that big deep quake on the feed here. There it is. And let's get all the others out of there. There we go. Wow. Wow. Sure looks like a lot, right? So here's our big, deep seven on the 14th. That was nine days ago. Did I say seven days ago? Oh, okay. Well, it's nine days ago. Nine days ago, this big, deep seven hit. And when a big, deep seven hit, we issued a seven to ten day watch. Go watch the video. And now what happened over to the west? And far over to the east, down below the plate boundaries, those red lines that I was showing you this whole darn update. The Indo-Australian plate. Something's going on down below it. Started over here, spread over to the west, spread over to the east. It's going to continue spreading over to the west and over to the northeast. Out and away, the wave is trying to go around the plate and escape out across. Hence, we're getting the breakout up here and down here. In case you don't know, up here is Ecuador, down here is Chile. But the wave is spreading out, and that's why it's following those areas. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Do you have an earthquake plan? Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? You need to know what to do. You need to pay attention to the earthquake activity and the flow in which way it goes. Once you understand there's a flow and it's flowing somewhere, you can start to keep track of it like a flood, 
Earthquakes are not random. They are following a trajectory, and you can follow the magnitudes out and away from the areas where it originates. Do we have anything else to talk about? Well, I could tell you what to prepare for. You could probably have an emergency kit. You could probably have a change of clothes and set of shoes, flashlight, batteries, water and food, medication, sanitation. I would just encourage you to have those things, those basic things. I could harp on you all day long. Are you going to do it or not? Maybe just a set of shoes by the side of your bed so you're not completely caught off guard. Anyway, I get sarcastic when I start reminding people over and over again. I don't want to be annoying, but please do it. Please prepare. Please have an emergency kit. It will get you through all kinds of disasters, not just an earthquake. Severe weather, fires, floods. Well, you'll need your ID. You'll need your extra set of keys. Extra seconds saved. If you know you have an extra set of keys in your emergency kit, You don't have to fumble around your house trying to find your key ring or your chain or whatever. And you can just grab your emergency kit. You'll know you'll at least have that in there. And people actually have a hard time finding things when there's a panic situation. You might end up finding your sunglasses instead of your valuable ring of keys. Anyway, food and water is going to be pretty hard, but you're probably going to need to do it. You'll need it for a little while. On the water, it's going to be a pump. Carrying it around with you is going to be more than 7 pounds a gallon, so that's going to be pretty heavy. That means some kind of pump or purification. And on the food, just take the time to have the appropriate food put aside, long-term or canned goods or whatever you can afford. All right. Let's save this as a video. Now that I'm able to record, it's a good deal. We'll upload it to YouTube, and you can watch it back later, hopefully. We'll premiere it back within an hour after it uploads. If you're on YouTube, hello. If you're on Twitch, watching live right now, hello. It's good to be back. I don't know how long I'll be back. I'm surprised. I was told it was going to be off for weeks until they could get a technician out. Well, turns out, don't need a technician. Go figure. Wow going to take weeks to get a technician out to you two days later it comes back on after all the big earthquakes hit well not all of them after two of the big earthquakes that i warned for hit and delaware peace out word up and much love